Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here and tonight I'm going to continue my review of the super deluxe version of Revolver, which includes not only the brand new remix uh, brought to us for 2022 and a new and remastered version of the mono version, but also all of the various outtakes and that's what the video is about tonight. Now if you want to know my reviews regarding the stereo versus the mono mix versus the well 2009 uh, remastered version of the original stereo mixes take a look at my last video. But tonight we're going to conclude with taking a look at all of the various outtakes and what they reveal to us as Beatle music fans. All right, so let's get right to it. We're gonna take a look at Tomorrow Never Knows, Take One versus Tomorrow Never Knows, Mono Mix, RM11. Now I'm not sure what RM, is that a Room 11 or a Remix 11? I'm not sure what it is, but for identification purposes, we'll just call it RM11. Now the first version, Take One, is one we've heard before, and we're taking a look at this tonight really to stress what this particular tape really reveals to us. You know, it's on this take that we see the Beatles are heading into a brand new not only style of writing, but even sonic territory as far as what they wish to deliver in the studio. But by the time we get to the RM11 mix, we can see that they've abandoned some of the ideas they had on the original take one and we're getting really close. Indeed, we're getting even closer than other mixes of this particular song. Now by that, what I mean is this particular outtake is actually my favorite mix on this album for this song. Everything is brought up front. Now I'd like you all to really take a look at these two outtakes because it's between these two outtakes we show the musical territory that the Beatles would cover in any particular song. And by that I mean the first outtake is breaking all the rules. And then they realize where the rule breaking wasn't taking them. A wonderful outtake. All right, next up, got to get you into my life first version take five now we've heard this version before i'm not sure if this is the actual take that we heard on the anthology but we've heard the beatles approach on this song and it should be on this uh, deluxe edition mainly for not only just historical purposes but as a valuable reference point here here we see the Beatles' first envisionment of this song. With a keyboard drone being prominent, again, like Tomorrow Never Knows, something they would abandon later on second thought. But it's in the second version, an unnumbered mix, that we hear the Beatles starting to get an idea of how they want to approach this song. I love the jangly guitars here that later mixes would pretty much mix out. The lyrics with additional vocals point to a traditional love song, which was not what this song was originally about, and the eventual version that we would hear would be much more open to what this song was truly about. A song that celebrates exactly what Paul felt when he first experienced marijuana. But it's on the next outtake, Take 8, that we hear at least stereophonically and as far as instruments go because this is basically an instrumental track. We hear how the horns have taken those jangly guitar parts for the most part as well as them being separated in the stereo mix. The left hand side of this particular mix is lower than the eventual mix. I think that was a mistake and it being lower in the mix you can hear where with the addition of Paul's vocals later on this wasn't going to be loud enough to really hear as part of that song. And one that showed uh, the uh, approach that the Beatles would eventually use. This is a wonderful track and it's an eye opener because Paul's vocals don't get in the way. For the first time, you can clearly hear instrumentally what's on this amazing song. Next up is Love You Too by George Harrison, take one. Here we see 
that this is just the basic idea. George is just trying to strum out the idea, the basic rhythm, and get the melody down to this song. You know, this particular track, as far as I'm concerned, everybody gives praise to John Lennon's uh, basic guitar and vocal approach for his uh, demo version for Strawberry Fields Forever. This is every bit as good as that particular demo version, and it really shows us where this song started from. But it's in the next outtake, the unnumbered rehearsal, where we can listen to the sitar and figure out how George placed it within the idea of the song. This is very eye-opening. And you know, in my last video, I talked about how they had really tamed the sitar. This version, we hear the most un- tamed sitar out of all of these takes. But that's important to note here. The reason is that the sitar was found to be a very difficult instrument to record, especially if it was recorded in any particular way that would reflect Western music. The sitar basically just goes all over the place without very specific miking techniques that Jeff Emmerich utilized to get the better mix for this particular instrument. Now with Love You Too Take 7, we hear a couple of things here. First of all, on the intro, we hear the engineer calling this song Granny Smith. You know, George Harrison was famous for not titling his songs. He'd walk in with a completed song with no title. And so they would often just give it a working title. Granny Smith being the working title to Love You Too. This is a great mix to hear the stereo spectrum and where they were finally developing it. We also hear some experimentation as far as harmonies that they wouldn't use in the final mix by Paul McCartney. Some of these harmonies even sounding quite flat but I think that's because of the Eastern influence of the entire song. Paul was trying to give us traditional Western harmony to a song that was basically written in a style and traditional Western harmonies often don't work in this kind of song. In the end, the Beatles realized this approach wasn't going to work. Again, very eye-opening how this song was developed. But you know, uh, this is an excellent example of when George did have a really good song the Beatles knuckled down. Often people would say that they just wouldn't give George that much time to get his songs recorded, and that's true to a degree. But on this mix, we hear they put quite a bit of work into George's Love You Too. Next up, Paperback Writer backing tracks one and two, and do you hear what's missing on this one? Paul's bass, right? Now, everybody makes a big deal about the fact that on Sgt. Pepper, Paul would often leave an entire track for him to include his bass guitar work. But it's on these outtakes that we see that Paul actually had started that practice, sometime at least, in recording Revolver. This is not the only song on this album where Paul lays his bass down on an isolated track because it's on these tracks that we see really the beginning of the exceptional bass playing by Paul McCartney. He was always an excellent bassist, as I've brought up in uh, videos before. Right on their first album, he was playing bass lines that many people on a lot of pop records wouldn't even attempt. Next up, Rain, take five, actual speed. Now, many people already know that Rain was recorded at one speed and then slowed down to give it that almost hypnotic quality to it. But listening to it at full speed, once again, listen to Paul McCartney's bass line. This is really quick bass playing, and it isn't a simple line, not at this speed. But this track also is eye-opening for another reason. They, on purpose, recorded this at a faster speed, knowing they would later slow it down. How do I know this? Listen to the register. Listen to the bass frequencies on Paul's bass. They would have been far too high in a final mix. They knew 
by slowing this tape down and bringing this song down to a lower register, those bass lines that Paul were playing were really going to shine through deep and rich. By the way, on Paperback Writer and Rain, Paul recorded his bass through a bass speaker. Now, to those of you who didn't hear me, I said recorded his bass through a bass speaker. He played his bass through a bass speaker, and because Jeff Emery came up with the idea, see, he knew, he had read, that a speaker and a microphone are basically the same thing technically, except they're reverse wired. So he took that little idea to Ken Townsend. It made sense to Ken. And so Ken got to work and rewired an extra bass cabinet to a microphone setting push that sucker right up to Paul's bass cabinet. Now we have one bass cabinet recording what one bass cabinet is driving. A great trick, and you know, the Beatles would abandon this trick after these two recordings, mainly because of better equipment that they could use to get lower bass responses. But when EMI did not have the ability to get the bass response that a lot of American recordings were getting, this is how the Beatles attacked this problem? Brilliant, absolute brilliant. As a matter of fact, a mark of genius. But what proof do I have for all this nonsensical kind of thinking? It's the very next outtake. Rain, take five, slowed down for the master tape. You see, it's on this wonderful take five uh, that's been slowed down where we see everything that I was talking about with the preceding track. Again, brilliant. Now, remember, I said that it was on this album that they actually started giving Paul an entire track for his bass sometimes. Well, on Dr. Robert, take seven, listen to that through your headphones and you'll hear Paul McCartney's bass over on the right-hand side. They couldn't do this unless it was on its own individual track. And when you're working with four track, every track is real estate that you really have to think about. Next up, Andrew Bird Can Sing, first version, take two. When I listen to this outtake, I hear 1965 Beatles. This sounds like a song that John could have written for help. Now the next outtake is something that I think we've heard, if it's not exactly like the one we've heard on Anthology, it is so close. This is the famous version, and by the way, this is the same version as the one we've just talked about, but this is the one where Paul and John giggle their way through uh, the harmonies on this song. The harmonies are great, but the giggling tells you the Beatles knew when to play and when to work. How do I know that? Just listen to Andrew Bird Can Sing, second version, take five. The Beatles are now back in the studio with a whole new approach, and there's no giggling this time. They plow their way through these vocals in the most professional manner you could possibly ask for. Next up, Taxman. Take 11. Now this is an interesting version. Here we hear a wider separation in George's vocals. He either double tracked his vocals or they used another invention from EMI called artificial doubling technique or ADT. Either way, I really love the sound of his separated vocals here. There's also a very interesting and brilliant high guitar note peppered into this version, a note they would abandon by the time or at least bury in the mix so far down that you don't hear it in the final versions. It's on this version we get those quick counter riff type of vocals from uh, John and Paul, da -da 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 -da, done in 16th notes, wonderful. I love this version. All right, so it's with I'm Only Sleeping, the rehearsal fragment, where we hear right from this fragment uh, approaches to the music, especially on keyboards, that they would use in the final version. Very interesting mix. But you know, it's with I'm Only Sleeping, take two, that we hear that there's still room 
for a whole lot of experimentation, a lot of vocal experimentation on this particular outtake that I love. But you know, it's on take five where we hear not only a tempo adjustment, but Paul really putting into uh, his bass playing here lines that would better support this entire song. This is how the Beatles worked, folks. They did whatever it took for the final product and they would never stop until they got what they wanted in the end. But you know, it's on mono mix RM1 of this very same song where we hear the Beatles get the whole vocal approach to this song. Here we see them starting to nail this song down. All right, that leads us to Eleanor Rigby, speech before take two. Now this is interesting because here we hear George Martin and Paul discussing using vibrato on the strings. That almost gives it a tremolo effect for the strings, right? And then they play them without vibrato because Paul was against vibrato. This whole discussion began actually with the song Yesterday. When they decided to put a quartet behind Yesterday, Paul was very adamant about not wanting vibrato on that instrumentation. And he was just as adamant about George suggesting vibrato again here for Eleanor Rigby. So George plays him different approaches to these strings, and Paul quite honestly says that he can hardly tell a difference. In the final mix, we hear they use both approaches. You know, that's where we see true genius at work. Paul's pre-thinking about not wanting vibrato, being proven that maybe it's not a big deal, and yet, coming to some sort of an agreement with George Martin. This is genius, folks. How do I know this? Well, how about the very next outtake? Eleanor Rigby, take two. It's here where we hear both vibrato and staccato strings. All right, so that leads us to For No One, take 10, backing track. It's interesting. This is at least a full step higher in tonal register. And the only thing that I can get from listening to this particular outtake is that they brought the tone down, slowed the whole thing down to better accommodate some of the horns that maybe couldn't have played what they wanted in this particular key. Either way, the final product was the way to go, but this is a very interesting and again, an eye opener about how the Beatles worked as a team. All right, so that leads us to Yellow Submarine, songwriting work tape, part one. Now we already discussed this in my video where we uh, covered some of the pre-releases. This was one of them for this album. And the thing that I want to reiterate here tonight is that this shows us that John Lennon was way more involved in writing this song than history has indicated. And by that, I mean by his own interviews and Paul's recollections, uh, both of them have kind of assigned this song as mainly Paul's. This is not the truth. And I brought up that how both of them were in an interview and John at the time in 1967, far before any of those latter interviews, acknowledged that the song was written from two different songs. One that he was working on, the verse, and two, the chorus that Paul had already written. They married these two, and this outtake proves it, because here we hear John singing the verse. Not the same lyrics yet, but the verse on his guitar. This is what he brought in to the studio. Now it's on the next track, Songwriting Work Tape Part Two, where we see how involved Paul was in shaping this song. And I think that's why probably Paul and John both gave Paul a lot of credit because it's Paul's uh, ideas here. You can hear it in the conversation. As a matter of fact, him even reminding John, uh, you won't be singing this, someone else will. Already at this point, they knew they were gonna give this song to Ringo. Next, we get to take four of Yellow Submarine before the effects. And you know what? To my ears, this almost still sounds like John Lennon is still singing here. But the inflections sound like Ringo. It's higher in register, which would indicate Lennon, and yet the inflection's very Ringoistic. I'm not sure exactly which Beatle is singing 
on this particular track. So there's a question for the tribe. Do any of you know which beetle actually sings on this outtake? Now it's on the next outtake, Yellow Submarine, highlighted with sound effects that this song, as far as I'm concerned, they should have gone with this approach. The marching that you hear at the beginning of this video with Ringo's spoken word would have added weight to this entire song if it had been retained in the final mix. This one is my favorite version of Yellow Submarine, bar none. Now, if there is an outtake that indicates that George didn't always get a whole lot of time to develop his songs, it's with, I want to tell you, speech and take four. Here we hear all of the elements right there in this song. And you know, hearing this version and comparing it with the final versions that we've discussed, we can tell that the Beatles didn't do a whole lot of work beyond this basic version. Of course, that leads us to here, there, and everywhere, take six. Now, this is interesting because Paul really extends the notes. He holds them longer. Wisely, Paul re-sang this and sang this in a more robust, yet not holding the notes at the end of each line like he does here. Again, very eye-opening, showing us the Beatles were always listening to these pre-mixes to find out either what's missing or what needed to be added. Here, it was what needed to be taken away. All right, next up, it's making me feel like my trousers are torn. I mean, uh, uh, she said, she said, John's demo. I love that line. You know, that line shows you just how quick thinking this man could be. He would quip things out that quick on the spot all the time. This demo just shows how important the other three Beatles were. John would often bring demos like these into the studio or make a demo like these in the studio just to get the ball rolling. It's with Paul and the other two where these kinds of songs would really start to progress. But you know, it's on take 15, backing track rehearsal, where we hear the Beatles get a lot closer to what would eventually wind up on this album. That covers about 59 of the 63 songs on this album, doesn't it? What's left? Well, how about the mono and stereo versions of Paperback Writer and Rain? Now on the mono version of Paperback Writer, the first thing I hear is punch and clarity and even an extension to the outro. The stereo version, including almost five Paperback Writer refrains, with this one, including six, a hint to a seventh. But it's the stereo version with the very deep bass in the center that really sells me on this song. This is the best version of Paperback Writer to exist. Now, I do have a bit of a problem with the mono version of Rain. It seems that some of the mid frequencies on Paul's bass have been dropped, and so we don't have quite the bottom that I would have expected on this track. But it's on the stereo version that everything is wonderful. A deeper bass, guitar separation, and at 49 seconds, the whole song blossoms. Like Paperback Writer, I would say this is the best version of Rain to exist. When we hear about the Beach Boys, we hear about how hard uh, Brian would work in the studio. With the Beatles, we got four Brians, really, didn't we? And guess what? Brian had the famous wrecking crew. Any musician he needed to play whatever part that came into his head. The Beatles played their own damn instruments. They were like a wrecking crew unto themselves. You know, in the last couple of weeks, I've covered a whole lot on this album, and it's only because of the release of this album that I've held off on my next Led Zeppelin Decoded video, The Brown Bomber Arrives, and until I can get that up, why not watch one of these videos? I I'm Michael Noland. We, of course, are the tribe, and I'll see you in my next video.